Hey, hi everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of Harvard College Effective Altruism, a student group belonging to a fast-growing global movement committed to the idea that we should use reason and evidence to make the world as good as, uh, as, good a, place as possible. This talk is part of our fellowship program, in which a group of students attends weekly dinners with guests such as Max or Peter Singer or Darren Asamoglu, uh, whose talks will come in the coming weeks. Uh, if you're interested in the idea of effective altruism and the idea of having dinners with people like Max, come talk with us after the talk. Uh, after the talk, like us on Facebook or send us an email to schedule a meeting. Uh, there's also going to be feedback forms that you can put your email address on uh, at the end. Uh, so now that you're all sold for effective altruism, let me introduce Alesh to introduce tonight's <laughs> guest. <laughs> all right. So Max Segmark like introduces himself either as a Cosmologist, if he feels like talking, or phys uh, physicist, if he doesn't. So let's hope that for tonight uh, he he will go with the former. Uh, he's a professor at MIT and author of over 200 uh, scientific papers. He's also known as Mad Max for his unorthodox ideas and passion for adventure. He explored uh, his ideas on the uh, ultimate nature of the universe in his amazingly readable book, Our Mathematical Universe. He recently founded the Future of Life Institute, for, uh, or co-founded, for which he gained support uh, of uh, the likes of Stephen Hawking, Morgan Freeman, or Elon Musk, and most importantly, Harvard College Effective Altruism. Um, <laughs> so far, however, uh, unlike Elon Musk, we weren't able to donate $10 million to uh, running FLI and giving grants uh, for AI research. But you're working on it. Right, we're slowly getting there. Um, um, anyway, well, anytime you feel, feel desperate about the future of humanity, you can, uh, you can come to the comforting thought that it's in the hands of Mad Max. So, with that, let me give the word to Max Tegmark. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. And just to give you another piece of evidence of how important Harvard Effective Altruism Group is, you know, when they post an event like this one, Elon Musk tweets it. Raise your hand if you saw a tweet from Elon Musk about exactly this. See? So you guys are rocking and rolling here. So I'm here to talk with you about the future of life with AI, nuclear weapons, and other powerful technologies. As the galaxies in the background indicate, I want to give a cosmic perspective on it. And as the music that played here a few minutes ago indicated, I want you to also encourage... I want to encourage you to look at the bright side of life. I don't, my goal is not for you to all leave this room more depressed than when you came in, but rather to actually leave more empowered. You had me back here, you, you had me here giving me a talk, I think it was about a year ago, because it was pretty cold and snowy, and you'll see at the end of the talk just how much we've all managed to accomplish together just since that last talk. On, on some of these big issues. And that's just an indication of how much, with your help, we can do in the next year. So let's dig right in. Our cosmic perspective, I think, should really affect how we think about these, these questions. Because we're not just limited to this little spinning ball in space, all right? We're not just limited for the next 10 years, 30 years, the next election cycle. We live in this grand solar system and this vast galaxy, 100,000 light years from side to side. You won't see too much of it because of all the light pollution, but that's, that's probably okay. Because you all know that the, we humans are the masters of underestimation, and we've greatly underestimated again and again the size of our cosmos and of our cosmic endowment, realizing that everything we thought existed was just a small part of something much grander, the planet, the solar system, the galaxy, galaxy clusters, and ultimately this incredible universe, which has about 10 to the 57 times more volume in it than anything we've accessed so far. So, the sky is literally the limit. There's just so much more opportunity for the future of life than people used to think. Some people get depressed about that and it makes them feel small. For me, it's exactly the opposite. This makes me feel incredibly excited that the, the opportunities we have with our human intelligence is just so much grander than what we thought. So hey, let's not blow it. Let's really make the most of these opportunities for the future of our universe. Now, it's not just that we have much more space 
and much more resources at our disposal, we also have vastly more time than we thought. You know, smart people like Archimedes and Newton had no clue really what was going to happen a thousand years from now. Well, now we know that we have not just thousands or millions, but actually billions of years, probably hundreds of billions of years of a future during which life could do all sorts of awesome things if we don't screw it up. So what's going to happen then down the road? What about the future of life? The way I think about it, we are experiencing a race. A race between, on one hand, the growing power of technology, and on the other hand, the growing wisdom with which we manage our technology. And it's really, really crucial that the wisdom win this race. With, kind of, with the old and rather feeble technologies we invented, like fire, for instance, it was okay to screw up in the beginning. And after a while, someone was like, hey, let's invent the fire extinguisher. Or the Harvard Fire Department. <laughs> with more powerful technologies, like nuclear weapons, you kind of more really wanted to get it right more or less the first time. Right? And the more powerful the technologies get, the more crucial it becomes that we get develop the wisdom in advance. In particular, as we're going to see with artificial intelligence, if we ever make ma machines that are much smaller than us, we'll only have one chance ever to get it right, and that's beforehand. And um, So depending on the winner of this, who the winner is in this race, just the sheer power of the technology or our wisdom with which to manage it, we can get a lot of different scenarios. We can have happy scenarios where the wisdom space is, is the winner, where we have billions of years to enjoy all this future awesomeness for life here on Earth and perhaps also beyond our, beyond our wildest dreams. Or there are many scenarios where the wisdom loses the race and somehow technology does end up doing things that we didn't intend, like accidental nuclear war, or we screw up our, our climate, or we make AI and things don't go so great. There's literature is full of, of different scenarios, and in this book, which I wrote, which Alish kind of mentioned, the whole last chapter of it is about this question. Who's going to win the race? The power or the wisdom? And uh, specifically what I do there is I take all the risks that people like to worry about, and I sort them in chronological order based on how urgent they are. So far away we see things which are going to, if they do us in, take a long time to do so. And what's kind of interesting here is that the, all the distant ones here, we actually have nice technical solutions for dealing with. If, you, if you're worried about what to do about the fact that the sun is going to evaporate the Atlantic Ocean in a billion years, ask me afterwards in the Q&A and I'll tell you a very cool solution to this involving <laughs> I'm using asteroids to nudge Earth to a larger orbit, or if you're worried about asteroid impact. And interestingly, all the most urgent risks which have the potential to do us in the soonest are things we cannot blame our universe for, we can only blame ourselves. <laughs> So the, good, the flip side, and the good news about this, if you want to always look on the bright side of life, is that if we can get our act together, not self-annihilate, we actually have a lot of time to take on, and I think successfully overcome, these other challenges. So, I have a bad habit as a professor, which is I like to give grades all the time, even if it's unsolicited. So I decided to give us humans a midterm grade for risk management 101. How are we doing so far on our quest to not go extinct and do awesome things with life. Well, I asked around some people today, maybe B minus, wouldn't be, so, B plus maybe, even, you know, after all, we've done a lot of stupid stuff, but we're still here. Could be worse. But I actually decided to give it D minus. And I want you to raise your hand if you are a student from MIT. Ooh, wow. Raise your hand if you're currently taking my electromagnetism course. <laughs> Okay, especially for you guys. I want it to be known that I'm known as a very lenient grader, okay? <laughs> and you should also know that, huh? They get extra credit, right? You get, and we also don't have D minus as legal grade at MIT, but I decided to get D minus. <laughs> so, why am I doing this? Because of the cosmic perspective. People have very different assessments of what the probability is that we go extinct in any one decade. Some people think, oh, it's very unlikely, maybe 10 to minus 4. Some think, oh, maybe 10%. Some people think somewhere in between. Any of these numbers are just pathetic if we're planning to survive for a thousand years, let alone billions, right? Because we're not. It's D minus, I say. And 
because we really need to think about this incredible amount of time and this, inc this, inc this incredible future cosmic endowment that we, we stand to squander by being reckless and sloppy now. And just to summarize in one single slide why I gave a D minus, look at this picture and, and, and tell me which one of these two people is more famous? <laughs> now, which one of these two people should we thank for us being able to have this conversation this evening? Because he single handedly stopped a Soviet nuclear attack during the Cuban Missile Crisis. I'll give you one clue. <laughs> it's not Canadian. <laughs> so D minus, I say. I mean, how lame is this? Why is it that my kids never learned about him in school? Why is it that there's no statue for him? Why have most people never even heard of him? Is it really so incredibly unimportant to, to prevent a uh, global nuclear war that we don't even care? Um, so this is the outline of the rest of my talk. I've already made the first basic point here that I feel we are doing a pathetic job managing risk from new technologies. Next thing I'm going to do is a little case study to emphasize why I think we're doing such a pathetic job. Looking at nuclear weapons, the business that Arkhipov helped a bit with. And then we'll get into some more examples with AI. And, and since I promised to try to cheer you up a little bit at the end, talk about what we can do and what we're already doing and how you can help. So let's look at the nuclear weapons case study. This is actually a very, this is a very old article. This is an article from 1954, the oldest article I have been able to ever find, giving really a comprehensive survey of what was going on with the hydrogen bomb, the whole, that there was a hydrogen bomb program and, and what was happening with this. And uh, it says it's written here by Jules Laurent, but it actually isn't. Uh, Basically, nobody knew who wrote this article because it was written by... This is a pseudonym because the guy who wrote this was afraid of getting in trouble under the, during the McCarthy period and just made up this name. But I will tell you tonight who this was, who wrote this. It was my dad, Harold. <laughs> so this is a little bit of a family tradition <laughs> to be concerned about nuclear stupidity. Okay? And here's how I think about it, sort of Dr. Zeus style in the cosmic perspective. We are on this little spinning ball in space. We humans, we've done a lot of wonderfully cool things which make me really proud to be a human. We invented writing, we invented all sorts of beautiful music and theater and art. We figured out all sorts of cool things about the cosmos and have done wonderful, kind things to one another. And we've also done some really dumb stuff. For example, and arguably the single dumbest thing we've done so far is we built this device. This is what it looks like. Okay? And the way I like to think about it, it's, it's a very interesting device, two knobs on it that says X and P. It's called the Spectacular Thermonuclear Unpredictable Population Incineration Device. And that's kind of a mouthful, so let's do an acronym. S-T-U-P-I-D for it, okay? So let me tell you about this device. It was very complicated to build. It took so much ingenuity from so many people that actually required the resources and talents of more than one country over the course of many years to create this thing. And not just engineering and technical ingenuity, but also a lot of social sciences ingenuity, where to make sure that all the people in this device did what they were supposed to do, they would wear special fancy clothing, and different kinds of uniforms, and have this complicated hierarchy where people learn to do things and overcome social inhibitions they normally wouldn't do. Um, and. Uh, it's a very complicated device, too, under the hood. It's kind of like a Rube Goldberg machine. So there's actually not a single person on the planet right now who knows how all parts of this device actually function. Uh, what does it do, this device? Well, it can create, cleverly, massive explosions around the planet. And that's basically what it does. Uh, let's talk a little bit about these two knobs. Before we do this, though, another remarkably cool thing about this device is even though no, basically nobody on this planet wants it to be used, somehow the inhabitants of this planet still got together and did all this incredibly hard work to build it. Pretty nifty, huh? Pretty S-T-U-P-I-D, <laughs> if you ask me. But let's look at it a bit more analytically. What are these two knobs? Well, the X knob determines the explosive power that it has, 
And the PNOG denotes the probability that it just goes kaboom by mistake in any random year. Okay? Because this is another clever feature it has. It not only can do things that nobody wants it to do, but it has this cool little feature that sometimes it just goes kablooey anyway. Okay? And we'll talk a little bit more about these two knobs. Let's start with the X knob. So how powerful explosions are there? Well, let's take a look. At, when, you look at a, when you look at something like this nuclear explosion here, you really, it's about to happen, you have almost no, um, it's very hard to get a sense of scale, how big this actually is. Apologies for the light pollution. How big is this really? Is it some, you've all seen these kind of videos. Uh, remarkably, I asked both of my kids yesterday, none of them have ever had any, learned anything in school at all and they're 14 and 16, about facts about nuclear weapons, like how many they are, how powerful they are, kind of what they do. That's probably part of the reason that we humans have somehow got roped into building this thing. So I want to just remedy that a little bit. Actually, let me ask you too. Raise your hand if you've ever taken any, studied, been taught in school, in a course, in a serious way, anything about nuclear weapons. Curious. I haven't either. So let's just dig, take five minutes and just get a little sense of scale. So, so let's, let's do, do a little nuclear explosion. Being from MIT, what better place to put it than ground zero than over the Harvard yard here. But, 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 sorry about being a, a rude, bad guest. But let's zoom out a little bit here because I think we might need to, to, to see what's going to happen. Let's set off the Hiroshima bomb here, 15 kilotons, okay? This is what happens about 70,000 dead during the first 24 hours. Uh, you can see that things, unfortunately, didn't go so well for MIT either. Uh, although, actually, Boston University and Boston College, at least if the wind isn't blowing this way, they aren't in the immediate fallout path. But uh, unfortunately, this explosion, this particular bomb is much, much smaller than the, the typical bombs today. So. Let's zoom out a little bit more, and instead take a sort of run-of-the-mill bomb today in the U.S. nuclear arsenal. Let's do a 455 kiloton bomb that's on using the Trident missiles, which the U.S. Uh, submarine-launched ballistic missiles have, are, are often equipped with, and, and see what happens. Then it looks like this. Okay, so that's sorry, Boston University. Um, but, the rest of uh, Boston, was in, we know it too. There's no way one could close those screens there. Any the chances there? I feel a little bad for you if you can't see. Um... Oh, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Okay, so now we have about uh, half a million people got killed in the immediate explosion here, and of course a lot more later. This still though is a hundred times smaller, actually in explosive yield than the one that we just watched in the beginning, which is 50 megatons. So if we zoom out even more and set that one off, you know, sorry Cape Cod. <laughs> so this is one nuclear explosion. But as you know, this, this uh, the clever device we humans have decided to build doesn't just have one hydrogen bomb in it. We actually have quite a lot. At the peak, we've had about 65,000. Now, you can see more recently the numbers have gone down and a lot of people have stopped paying attention because of this. Looks like there's almost nothing left, right? Well, only 16,000 or so hydrogen bombs left. We looked at one explosion. And it's not just the US and Russia who have them, but we keep adding a new nuclear power on average about every five years, including such enormously stable countries like Pakistan. <laughs> and. Uh, One of the most astonishing things is actually that the, the single most worrisome thing ever to be discovered about the harm that nuclear weapons do wasn't even known when I was born in the 60s, when they decided it was a good idea to have 65,000 of them. It only became known really in the 80s. And I'm talking now about the following. This is what Earth looks like on a typical day. This is what it would look like after a nuclear war. And then you wait a little bit longer, and more and more of the northern hemisphere, where most of the explosions happen, get covered with dust. 
blocking out the sunlight and causing a nuclear winter. And uh, I just came back from a conference in New York where I gave a talk talking about this, and then I suddenly realized I read the name tag of a guy sitting in the audience, and it was Alan Robach <laughs> who had done this calculation. And it's an amazing calculation. When, you, when nuclear winter first started being discovered and talked about by scientists in the 80s, they used supercomputers to do their, their work, which were less powerful than this. Okay? Today, he's repeated this with the much more powerful computers of the day and realized that what they did then was actually too optimistic. This doesn't typically last two years, often lasts for about a decade. And um, if you're on the ground, on a typical nice summer day, this is what it might look like. The sun would look about as bright then as the full moon does at night now. So imagine doing farming for, you know, for during that time. And this is a, a weather map. This is how many degrees Celsius, not Fahrenheit, Celsius, colder it is after a, a global nuclear war during the first couple of years. So you'll see that for typically the American breadbasket, where we grow a large fraction of our, of our grains, it would be about 20 Celsius colder, about 40 Fahrenheit colder than normal. And part of the Russian breadbasket is 35 Celsius, 70 Fahrenheit colder. What does that mean in plain English? It means like when you go out to harvest your nice cornfield, it might look like this that day. And you don't need to have a huge amount of imagination to feel that, well, you know, maybe a decade of this wouldn't be all that awesome. Uh, if you have 7.3 billion with no food, even if you personally happen to have, you know, a year of canned food stored up somewhere, you know, what are you going to do when, when those who didn't but had a lot of guns, you know, come for a little visit and, and the armed gangs go door to door and basically screw things over for whatever people are left. And then and add to this, of course, just complete collapse of the infrastructure. Just look what happens even with a very minor thing like, like Hurricane Sandy, you know, power outage, and par only part of New York City for only like a week. Now multiply that by 10 years and make it basically worldwide. Uh, not the most awesome thing. So that's what the X button does. And the bad news is that even though we now have much less hydrogen bombs than we used to at the peak, we're down to 16,000. Alan told me that unfortunately he thought that the nuclear winter predictions were going to get better, but they didn't really. Uh, and then he realized that the main reason for this was that they had so much overkill as the as some of the designers of this machine like to call it, which basically means you keep nuking the same city over and over, like nine times, just to be on the safe side. <laughs> if you just nuke it once, you get basically the same amount of, of fire and soot going up into the atmosphere. So, so we would be pretty royally screwed if we if we accidentally went to couple of with with this uh, right now. Now. What about the P knob? The probability that goes off by mistake? We don't know what P is. Different experts have different ideas. We know the P isn't zero, though, because we've had a lot of close calls that many of you know about where it almost went off by mistake because of computer malfunction, power failure, faulty intelligence, navigational error, bomber crash, exploding satellite, and a whole range of other causes. You can ask me more afterwards. Here are two people on the right. One of them we already talked about who single-handedly may have stopped the thing from going off. There might be other stories we haven't even heard about. So P certainly isn't zero. We don't know for sure you know, what P is, but we can talk a little bit about how it's evolved. It used to be zero before 1945, and then it obviously went up. Um, there was a general sense that it went down a bit when the um, Cold War ended because the people were less paranoid. But there, there are other... And then there was also a sense at this conference that Maya and I just came back from that it's gone up again now in what many people are calling the second Cold War with this very, very much more aggressive uh, atmosphere between the US and Russia, where they're much more paranoid of each other. Um, there are also other things which, for, for whatever clever reasons, uh, we humans have decided to do, which increased speed, for example, uh, just to give one example, the Trident submarine launched ballistic missiles. They have, each have 24 missiles on them with, with multiple warheads. So they can deliver about 100 hydrogen bombs each. They, there's this plan to replace two out of the 24 with conventional explosives instead of nukes. This might sound like a cool idea, because maybe you can just send one of those 
uh, North Korea or whatever, and it's not nuclear. But how, can anyone, I mean, you can't possibly, how could such an idea possibly get misinterpreted by the Russians? I can't think of any. No. So, so, so there are a lot of little things like this. Also, the, the idea of mutual assured destruction very much hinged on the fact that for years we had these very powerful bombs which were very imprecise in their targeting, which made it almost impossible to have a successful first strike. So you were pretty much guaranteed that if you tried to do a first strike, there would be enough surviving missiles on the other side that you would get hammered. We're moving away from that because now we have GPS and incredibly precise targeting. And we also have much more, much shorter flight times with submarine launch missiles very close to Moscow or New York and so on, so that the time scale for decisions is much, much shorter. And more and more of the decisions are also being automated with putting, putting in more artificial intelligence systems into these things. We can talk more about how that might act, affect things. It could increase P, it could decrease P. Bottom line is, I think any, any P, which is the probability per year that it goes off, above 10 to the minus 10 or something is just completely unacceptable. And uh, we should uh, come back and talk about what we can do about this. But, to cheer you up, let's talk about something I worry even more about. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about unfriendly artificial intelligence. So, what is artificial intelligence? Well, what is intelligence? Human intelligence just means we take information in from various sensors we have, process it in our brain, and then send it out to various actuators we call muscles and do stuff, right? Machine inte artificial intelligence just means we replace some of these things by things we can build ourselves. And historically, we started out mostly first understanding how to replace the actuators. We built the steam engine and electrical motors and things that could replace muscles. We started discovering how to build certain kinds of sensors, microphones, cameras, and things. And gradually, we've also started chipping away at understanding more and more about how to replace the information processing and thinking part with better and better software. Now, you can drive cars and beat humans in jeopardy and various other things. So, so where does this leave us? The main point I want to take you to take away from my nuclear discussion, actually, is the one highlighted here in yellow. But I feel that our demonstrated ineptitude with the STUPID device, you know, how we've handled nuclear risk, really implies that it would be very naive to trust our leaders to do any better with the potential risk from future AI. Why? Because, you know, it's even harder to get non-specialists to understand this risk, since as opposed to nukes, it doesn't exist yet superhuman AI, right? And we don't know if it even will. We don't know how to build it. it. It's kind of like if you went up to some guy in 1920 and said, hey, you know, you should worry about nuclear weapons. And they're like, what? Nuclear what? And you try to explain that, you know, 25 years from now you think maybe someone is going to figure out a way of making these ginormous explosions and they're like, Just get out of here. <laughs> That's where we are with this, right? Yet, uh, I think it's also clear that this is potentially more dangerous than, than um, the nuclear weapons. So let's talk about this a little bit more. There are a lot of, of implications of artificial intelligence. Some of them can be absolutely awesome. Uh, some of them we need to be concerned about. So this is not like Ebola where there's only a downside and no upside. Everything I love about civilization is the product of intelligence. So it's clear that if we can amplify our own intelligence with AI, there's a lot of opportunity for doing wonderful things with us. Like with, but with, like with other powerful technologies, the more powerful it is, the more important it is that we also develop the wisdom first to make sure it actually does what we want it to do and is beneficial. Uh, it's pretty obvious that AI will have a huge impact on the economy. My MIT colleagues, Eric Brynjolfsson and Andrew McAfee, have presented data which they claim show, argues that the, the sharp rise in inequality that we're, we've, we're seeing, which has now surpassed uh, the Great Depression levels and sort of approaching the Gilded Age, that this is actually in large part caused by machine intelligence. So far, nothing superhuman. It's, it's, it's pretty simple stuff like TurboTax that replaces white collar, takes away white collar jobs. But they're predicting, but the 
There are a lot of serious economists who argue that the smarter the AI gets, the more inequality we're going to get. And that we might soon be in a situation where half of our jobs are gone, and then it, this is a good time to start thinking about what to do about this. I'm going to move on instead and talk about longer term future. Will we ever get machines that are smarter than us? In other words, that can outperform us on all cognitive tasks? And if so, how and, and when? This is very controversial. Different people have a lot of different opinions. But um, at a recent conference that I'll tell you more about soon, we, we managed to bring together a large fraction of the world's leading AI builders. And we did a poll there and asked, well, what do they think? And this is what they thought. How many years do you, they think it's going to take until AI can match us humans on all cognitive tasks? Some of them thought, oh, it's never going to happen, or it's going to be hundreds of years. But interestingly, most of them were much more optimistic about their field, and thought, actually, it's going to happen a lot sooner. It's a huge uncertainty, so we clearly don't know when it's going to happen. But you can see that about half of them thought that this is going to happen in their lifetime. And um, this means that if somebody tells you that they're completely confident that we're not going to have superhuman AI in our lifetime, that means that they don't fully understand what's actually happening in the field. Because these are the experts in the field. I'll come back and take questions at the end. And uh, so, so, another interesting thing from talking to a lot of AI people here is that uh, this histogram has actually changed a lot in the last five years. Because there were a lot of things which many people thought five years ago thought were going to take decades to do, which have happened all of a sudden. So what are some of these things? What, are, what is some of this amazing progress that's recent? Well, GoFi, which is the nerd acronym for good old-fashioned AI, there the key algorithms were programmed in by humans. So at some level, the intelligence of the machine was limited by how clever the programmer was. Nonetheless, GoFly accomplished a lot of stuff. It kicked Gary Kasparov's posterior in chess and made self-driving cars and so on. And in, in fact, even the Jeopardy victory of Watson was largely in this, this category, and so are self-driving cars. Uh, but many of the latest AI breakthroughs that are getting the AI researchers most excited and sometimes also most concerned are actually different kind of AI where where the machine instead learns, a bit like a child. A child, my children can have the potential to get much better than me at a lot of tasks that I don't even know how to do, right? Because they learn. And uh, this is precisely what deep learning is all about. <clears throat> you, you build a system which is able to learn. Uh, look at this, for example. This is, came out of Google last year. It doesn't look very impressive. It's some people playing frisbee and then there's a caption, except this caption wasn't written by a human. It was written by this, this piece of deep learning software. Try to write that code yourself in five minutes. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> and how did it do it? Did they have like typed in, oh, if it's a thing which is shaped like this and so on, it's probably a frisbee? No. It just learned. It just showed this thing vast numbers of different images and it with some correct classifications on some of them, and it learned. It show the same this picture to the same software, and it says it's a herd of elephants walking across a dry grass field. These are things which five years ago a lot of very serious AI researchers thought was decades away, and it's here. Let me show you another thing, which five dec five years ago a lot of people thought we was going to be decades away. This is uh, Demis Hassabis sitting here in the middle at the Wired 2014 conference. I'll let him speak for himself. First time the machine has ever seen this data stream, this pixel data stream. So it has no idea it's controlling the green rocket at the bottom of the screen. It has no idea how to get points, no idea how it loses lives. But you'll see it loses its three lives almost immediately. So it's just playing randomly at the moment. 
Then after overnight trainings on a single GPU machine on our servers, it's just playing the game some more. You come back in the morning, and now it's better than any human can play the game. So every single uh, bullet hits something. Um, it can't be killed anymore by the space invaders. It's worked out that the mothership at the top of the screen going across now is worth the more, most points. It does these unbelievably accurate shots to, to, to get those points. And it's built, you know, as Ben was saying, it's built up such an accurate model of this world. Let me see if I can stop Enya and <laughs> try again. I apologize. So this is literally the first time the machine has ever seen this data stream. So, this so I'll jump forward again to where we were. But basically what's happened here is they have this software, right, that Demis and his team at Google DeepMind have built, which simply learns to play Atari computer games the way a kid would. They haven't given it any instructions at all except maximize your score play over and over again. The only thing the computer gets as input is the, the pixel values, a bunch of numbers, and the only th output from the computer is commands the joystick. And let me see if we can so this is literally do this without the Enya. So every single uh, bullet hits something. Um, it can't be killed anymore by the space invaders. It's worked out that the mothership at the top of the screen going across now is worth the more, most points. It does these unbelievably accurate shots to, to, to get those points. And it's built, you know, as Ben was saying, it's built up such an accurate model of this world that it's in, that if you watch the last space invader, they get faster as there's less of them. Watch the last bullet. It sort of predictably fires where it thinks the, the, the space invader will be in a few seconds' time. So it's, it's, it's perfectly modeled, this um, you know, very complex data stream. Now, of course, these are just games, but this could be anything. This could be climate data, this could be um, economics data, stock market data, anything that has uh, 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 temple sequences of data, which is most things these days. I'm just going to show one last video, which is my favorite one, um, which is our, our game Breakout. Now, in Breakout, you control this um, bat and ball at the bottom of the screen, and you're trying to break through this rainbow-colored brick wall. And here, this is after 30, literally 30 minutes real-time training. So it's done 100 games. And you can see it's pretty terrible at the game, but you can see it's starting to get the idea that it should move the bat towards the ball. So it loses a life when the ball goes past it. This is after an hour now, real-time play. So it's 200 games. So you can see it's quantitatively better, but it's still not brilliant. Now, two hours in, now it's more or less mastered the game. So it can you know, always, almost always get the ball back. Um, and even when the ball's coming back at a very fast angle. So it's better than most humans can play this now. And then we thought, well, that's pretty good, but what happens if we just leave it playing some more? So we just left it playing the game for another couple of hours. And then to our surprise, it came up with this optimal strategy, which is to dig a tunnel around the side <laughs> and then send the ball around the back in this unbelievably, you know, superhuman accurate way. And actually, the funny thing about that is that the designers of the system, these, these brilliant guys at, at DeepMind, you know, they, um, they're, not actually very, they're not actually very good at playing the games, and they didn't know that, about that strategy themselves. So they actually learned something from the, their own program that they had created. Which... So that's deep learning for you. And I hope this gives you a little bit of a flavor of why people in the field are so excited. There are all these things they thought were going to be decades away, and now they're happening. And... Uh, if you can start playing old Atari games, then of course it's a very small step towards playing 3D games and then have, tell a, have a robot that thinks it's playing a 3D game when it's walking around in the real world and, and, and off you go. The reason you can talk much better into your phone now and have it understand what you're saying compared to five years ago is also because of deep learning. These are algorithms which learned. Nobody really understands exactly how they work either, but they, 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 they learn. And uh, machine translation is being revolutionized by this. It's, it's, it's an incredible um, virtuous circle in the field. These are a few slides uh, that Stuart Russell shared with me. He is uh, the grand old man of artificial intelligence in the sense that he wrote, literally wrote the book on it. The, the standard textbook everybody uses is Russell in Norvig, and this is Stuart. He, as he likes to say, you know, once you cross the usability threshold, and small improvements in this kind of stuff is, are worth enormous amounts of money. Speech, text understanding, object recognition, automatic vehicles, domestic robots, and all sorts of stuff. And so that's why you've seen this incredible shopping spree in the news recently when Google and Facebook and others just keep buying up AI companies. The traditional goal of the field has been that the more intelligent, the better. 
But what if we succeed with this goal? Then what happens? This is a question people didn't use to ask very much, and you can understand why, because it didn't seem like you were going to succeed in their lifetime, so you know, leave it to for future generations. But now all of a sudden, a lot of people are thinking, well, maybe we will succeed, which makes it prudent to start thinking about it. What if we succeed? There's a great essay about this from 1965 by Irving J. Good, where he says that, you know, the first ultra-intelligent machine is the last invention that man need ever make. And the argument he gives is very simple. He says, suppose you have a machine which is better than us humans at all cognitive tasks. Well, designing a smarter machine is also a cognitive task. So it's better than us at that. So the first thing it can do is reprogram its software and become smarter. And then it can do that again, and then it can do it again. And it's not going to take a year each time. Maybe it'll take a minute each time, or a second each time, or whatever. It can keep iterating. And, and um, that opens up the possibility that you get this recursive self-improvement, which before too long might make it not just a little bit better than us, but just leave us totally behind in the dust. And you, we can imagine machines that are as much smarter than us as we are smarter than science. So Irving Good ends by saying here that, you know, this will be the last uh, invention that we humans ever need to make for providing, and talks about how that could be a good thing if we can also figure out, you know, how to make the machine actually do what we want afterwards. Uh, and um, so it's clear, I think, that uh, success would be the biggest event in, in human history. And it's important to make sure it's not the last. And this is just not me saying this either, <laughs> only and some physicist who is not the AI expert. This is Stuart Russell, who's one of the lead world's most respected AI researchers. And so this obviously needs serious thought. And, and uh, the way Stuart likes to think about this is when you get this email, you know, to humanity at un.org from some aliens, you're like, hey dudes, be warned, we're going to get here to Earth in 30 to 50 years. What are we going to do? Are we just going to reply like this? <laughs> Probably not. But the situation is exactly analogous, except it's we who might be creating these super intelligent beings, which makes it much better for us, because we have all this influence over what's going to happen, right? But just sticking your head in the sand and not thinking about it seems like a pretty bad way to prepare. The, the past year has been really, really cool and interesting, because there's been a huge shift in, in the public perceptions around this. There's been First of all, a lot of big misconceptions floating around, which has made the whole discussion of this unnecessarily inflamed and polarized. One misconception is that anybody who is concerned thinks that this is right around the corner. That's absolutely not the point. As long as, long as the, you, you cannot rule out that it will happen in our lifetime, it's very prudent to think about it. Right? As long as I cannot rule out that our house will burn down, it's prudent for me to have a fire extinguisher at home and buy fire insurance. Just take some precautions. It's the same here, except the stakes are much higher. Another misconception is that people who are concerned uh, just overdosed on stupid Hollywood flicks with robots that shoot you. This is just such a red herring, and I get so frustrated every time I see it. <coughs> First of all, robots, the ability to build hinges and connect motors to them, is that that's not new technology. That's very old technology. Right? What's new isn't the hinges or the motors, or the sensors. What's new is the intelligence itself. That's the point, not robots. And, and um, in fact, even you, to cause a lot of impact on the world, for good or for bad, you don't need to have robot muscles or anything. You just have to be able to communicate with the world. Humans do a lot of harm just by talking. Look what Hitler managed to accomplish just by talking. right? So. Another common misconception is that what we have to fear somehow is that we build these smart machines and for some reason they're evil and decide to come like the Terminator and start shooting at <laughs> us and stuff like that. And then, other, then the critics come and say, that's ridiculous. Why should a machine be intrinsically evil just because it's not made of carbon? They're right about that. There's absolutely no reason the room by your vacuum cleaner should have some malevolence against humans, right? But the point, they're, they're tilting against windmills, the people who get pissed off about this, because this is not what the serious people are concerned are, are saying either. They're not worried about, I'm not worried about malevolence, that if you build a super smart machine, it's going to have something against me. 
what you have to be worried about is simply that if you have a very intelligent system, what does intelligence mean? It means basically you're very good at accomplishing your goals, right? So you just have to be concerned, that the, you have to make sure that the goals of this thing are aligned with our goals as humans, right? Suppose I'm an ant, and then humans come along, and they're smarter than me, the ant, you know. I might be like, oh, I'm not worried, because why should humans hate me as an ant? Raise your hand if you actually really hate ants. <laughs> well, see, I'm glad, I appreciate your honesty, but I only see two hands. I'm the kind of guy, I like ants. If I'm walking down the street and I see an ant there, not only am I not going to stomp on it on purpose, but I like walk around it. Okay. But like, like so for example, you didn't say that you hated ants, but suppose you're in charge of building this uh, awesome clean energy project. You build a big hydroelectric plant. You can do this nice, this big dam, you know, it's great. You're really excited about improving the environment with this. And then in the last minute, you realize there's an ant tail right in the middle. What are you going to do? Tough luck for the ants, right? It's not because he's an evil ant hater. It's just that her goals weren't aligned with those of the ants. Tough luck for the ants, right? Similarly, if, if, we, if we cede control to some entities which are much smaller than us and have goals which we thought were aligned with ours but they aren't, they might decide that we're in their way somehow or they need our atoms for something else. You know, they're, it's very important, in other words, to actually align our values. To so make sure that we can understand what the values are of AI, what they want to accomplish, and make sure that the things are aligned with ours. That's harder than it, harder than it sounds, because if, if you take uh, a self-driving car, let's see that you can talk to, it's your new AI mobile, okay? And, you just, and, it, and it just does exactly everything you ask it for. The battery value. Oh. Yeah. Does anyone have a battery? I think there's a spare battery in the left hand. Do you want to yeah. have a little fun with this while I keep talking? Yeah. Then, uh, okay. And you tell it, take me to the airport as fast as possible. Okay? <laughs> It'll get you there, chased by helicopters and covered in vomit. <laughs> and then you're like, wait a minute, no, I don't mean do literally what I said, I mean do what I meant. Right? And that's easy for a human taxi driver, because they know more about you than what you said, because they have all these shared human values and stuff like that. But, but if you're trying to explain to a machine what to do, you can't take anything for granted. Machines will do exactly what you tell them. When you're, raise your hand if you ever got the blue screen of death from, a, from your computer. It crashed it. Well, it didn't do that to, because it disobeyed you. It did exactly what it was programmed to do. That's the problem, right? Except that wasn't really what you wanted, right? So this is a hard problem. There are many issues like this one really should worry about. Another one is some of the people in the AI community have long thought that the only people who worried about this were Luddites who didn't know what they were talking about. Uh, so Stuart Russell at this conference we had with all these AI people said, and they think you are all Luddites. And the participants laughed very hard because these were, of course, largely a bunch of AI experts. Thank you. So there are a lot of misconceptions here. And so in summary, Stewart feels that the AI community has spent a lot of time just running blindfolded towards, towards the biggest event in human history. And, and he feels, and I agree with him, but we really need a fundamental change in the way the AI field defines itself. Rather than saying the goal is just to make machines as intelligent as possible, the goal should be to make AI as beneficial as possible for humanity. And um, what can we do to make this happen? So hopefully I've depressed you enough now for one day. <laughs> Let's switch the cheering you up for the final minutes of the talk. What can we do? A lot, actually. And that's what I want to end on. I think, uh, how much, how many more minutes do I have? Yeah? Go for ten. Okay, so, let me very briefly say a little bit about nuclear weapons first. So, one thing that's remarkably helpful is just getting the facts out. It actually really does help. For example, a common explanation of this graph is that the reason that the nuclear stockpile got cut from here to there which was always a good in terms of the amount of nuclear winter you'll have if, if the stupid machine goes off. It was caused by the end of the Cold War. But you can make a good case that that's not true. 
that the main reason it's actually turned around was a different one, because of some because of scientific research that was done on nuclear winter. Look at when the turnaround happens. It happened before the, the Cold War end, before the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1990, right? This is exactly when the nuclear winter research came out, and people started realizing, oh my god, uh, it's not mutual assured destruction, it's M-A, mad, it's, it's self-assured destruction, sad. Like, <laughs> suppose the U.S. launches this fantastic first strike against Russia, or the Soviet Union then, which is so successful that not a single Soviet Soviet nuke explodes on U.S. territory. You would say we won, right? No, we didn't. Then we get this new. Then we get ten years of no food and very little sunshine, and we get we're com just completely screwed. So it's an own goal, is what it is, right? Um, but this became clear. It had a big impact. Uh, you don't have to take my word for it. You can just take the word of the people who actually made the decisions to start cutting stockpiles. Such famous peaceniks as Ronald Reagan. Uh, here's what he actually he's already actually said in an interview about this. Already in 1985, five years before the Soviet Union collapsed, he said, talks about nuclear winter here. He says, uh, a great many reputable scientists are telling us, you know, about nuclear winter. You can read for yourselves here. Volcanoes, we saw the weather so changed that there was no snow in July in many temperate countries, and they call it the year in which there was no summer. Now, if one volcano can do that, what are we talking about with the whole nuclear exchange, the nuclear winter that scientists have been talking about? It's possible. This very much influenced him to want to greatly reduce the nuclear stockpile. <laughs> Gorbachev, who, with whom Reagan negotiated and agreed upon many of these dramatic cuts, says basically the same thing. He says, look, models made by Russian and American scientists showed that nuclear war would result in a nuclear winter that would be extremely destructive to all life on Earth. And this was a great stimulus to us to act, right? So, who did this? Was it some super well-funded mega effort? No, it was a handful of scientists with like a few hundred thousand dollars in grant support. Some guy in Rutgers University, a couple of guys in, in, so, in Soviet Union, had this huge impact. Simply by, fate, by doing good science and really getting the word out, right? So that shows the great power that people like you can have. Another thing you can do right now is, is pick a very simple, clear-cut battle and, and, and fight it. I th my favorite with nukes is just to create stigma around nuclear weapons, because there's this very pervasive meme out there. Most people I ask will say, well, even my science colleagues at MIT, they'll say, oh, well, you know, yeah, it's terrible with all these nukes, but, you know, uh, it's really thanks to the nuclear deterrence that we haven't had, that we're not, we haven't had any terrible war between the U.S. and Russia, you know, and it provides stability, and I know it's bad, but, you know, I don't think we can do without them either. That's what most people say, right? But, I think you can make it very... So if you say, oh, I think we should abolish all nuclear weapons or whatever, and go on a big campaign with peace signs and things, you're going to meet very hostile resistance. So pick, let's pick a middle ground argument, which is much easier to defend, which basically everybody you know, who's logical and listens will have to agree with, and push for that. I think we can make a very good argument that having any nation... Having more than 200 nukes is just completely wasting their money for no gain whatsoever. Uh, how many nukes do you need to have good deterrence? Really one, right, to drop on your en enemy's capital. But maybe you want the second one if it doesn't work. And Okay, let's do 200 so you have the most in the world. Because all other nations other than U.S. and, and Russia have less than 200. Uh, if we could cut from the current 8,000 that the U.S. has to 200, huge improvement for nuclear winter, right? The turns wouldn't be reduced at all. A lot of money would be saved. So I think you can argue that the U.S. And, or Russia could just unilaterally cut back to 200 and be incredibly intimidating still. And this would mean then that further nuke building and modernization, which the U.S. Is, and Russia and China are currently budgeting billions and billions of dollars for, is actually just completely dumb and a waste of money. So, so one thing you can actually do is you can just lobby your pension fund to make sure that at least your money doesn't get invested in, in companies building nuclear weapons. Because you can say, you know, I'm not, nuclear weapons aren't illegal. Smoking isn't illegal either, but I just don't want my pension invent, invested in cigarette companies or gambling companies or whatever. And 
to make things easier, you can look up your pension fund on this Don't, don't Bank on the Bomb website. They've tracked the $402 billion being invested in, in building nuclear weapons and modernizing them. And they've actually done this very clever campaign, which is getting some traction. It's a grassroots, totally grassroots campaign founded by these two women we met in New York. Just like a, and now they have a slick website, but they can use help. They just got the biggest pension fund in all of Holland to adopt the official policy that they're not investing in cigarettes and they're not investing in nuclear weapons. And there's this divest movement. Um, it's very easy. You can, take, you can take 15 minutes if you have some savings account, your parents have a pension plan or whatever. You know, call them up and ask, are you investing in nuclear, my funds in nuclear weapons? And they'll be like, no, no, no. And then you can tell them, well, you know, actually you are because you're investing in this company. No, really? And, and then many of these companies actually want to have a, a sort of profile where they don't invest in uh, what they consider sort of sin stocks, right? And this is a very good way of starting to create the sort of stigma around nukes, which has been so successfully created around smoking. Smoking isn't illegal, but raise your hand if you're a smoker. Wow. If I did this poll in 1930, it would have been so different, right? Why? It's not because smoking has been banned. It's not because there's some politicians from the top did this. But a bunch of scientists, first of all, kind of won the debate and really managed to persuade people that smoking was harmful. And it created a stigma. It's not considered that cool to be a smoker anymore. Most smokers I know are trying to stop. And uh, one way you can help create this kind of stigma is by getting this sort of divest campaign. And every time some company that adopts this policy, it gets in the news. So this is one very simple little thing you can do. Contact, go on this website. Uh, let me talk about another case study, artificial intelligence. What can be done there? Well, a lot. So let me tell you what we've done just since I was here a year ago. We, we decided to found the Future of Life Institute, and please stand up if you are one of the founders, or if you're, and if you're, some, if you're associated with FLI, Future Life Institute in some other way. Awesome. Yay, I think I want to give all of you guys a round of applause for making this happen. We launched this one year ago. Our first ever meeting was at our house March 1st last year. We got a bunch of awesome uh, scientists and others to join. And the uh, first thing we did was we got together and wrote an article to draw more attention to the AI problem. We knew in advance that because Stephen Hawking was one of us who wrote this, it was just going to be remembered forever, as Stephen Hawking says. It doesn't matter that Frank Wilczek has a Nobel Prize or that Stuart Russell is like the textbook author on AI. It's Hawking says. But this has, you notice there are 30,000 there 30, shares on this thing, and it propagated through the media, and as you all know, there was a huge amount of media, the stuff that got triggered by this. Stephen Hawking kept being in the news for the rest of the year on this, and then Elon Musk chimed in, and suddenly it became too hard to just ignore this for the, for the people who are very skeptical. And we felt this is a great environment and a great opportunity for us to actually persuade all the leaders in this field to get together and have a conference. And for the first time, really just focus on talking not about how to make AI more powerful, but on how to keep it beneficial. Okay? So a lot of people said, ah, nah, it's crazy. You can't do that. You know, if some phys someone comes in, some physicist calls, you called up an AI professor and says, come to our AI conference, he'll be like, dude, if I want an AI conference, I'll organize my own, thanks. But, you know, after spending way more time than I care to admit on this, and with a lot of awesome help from all the people who just stood up in the room here, we managed to pull this off. We had this incredible group of people in Puerto Rico in January, where you have Dennis Asabis, who showed this incredible Atari game playing stuff, and Shane Legg and Mustafa Suleiman from his company, a whole bunch of other people from Google, uh, a lot of the top professors, a bunch of the other companies, and also a bunch of economists and lawyers. It's just a fantastic, fantastic group. And uh, remarkably, even though it seemed in the media like there was this great controversy about this, here there was an amazing consensus once we got the journalists out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> a consensus that, you know, both the opportunities and the challenges of AI are really great. And there's a lot of really useful research we can work on right now that will help maximize our chances of, of getting beneficial AI. And we didn't stop at that. We also had a lot of brainstorming throughout last fall and at the meeting about what specifically we could do. And there's an 11-page document you can find on our website full of specific things. And we wrote this open letter 
which basically says that uh, he has to, we have to redefine AI, the goal of AI, from just making things as smart as possible to making things beneficial. And we almost every, basically everybody at the conference signed it, and then another 5,000 people signed it too. And, and that's amazing. Now we have basically a who's who of AI who have endorsed this. So this is no, whereas a year ago when I was here speaking, this was a fringe view. And a lot of young people in AI were afraid to even talk about this for we, fear of being viewed as cuckoo or, or a weirdo. Nobody can dismiss this kind of concern anymore because then they're implicitly telling, saying that the founders of deep learning who have signed here are idiots or the president of the <laughs> biggest AI society in the world and the ex-president and the ex-president before that are all idiots, you know. <laughs> so it really helped legitimize having a serious discussion about this. And then, adding to the fun, Elon Musk was at the conference, and he's like, okay, I hear you guys. You have a bunch of research you want to do to make AI safe. You say you need some resources to do it. Here are some resources. Here. <laughs> and then he gave 10 million bucks to our organization, and we used this to launch this grants program where so here's what Elon had to say about this. We have the it seems Mayor made this video. very obvious to me that humans should attempt to make the future of humanity good. And, and the coolest part of all is, beforehand, you know, this was portrayed in the media largely as Elon Musk and us attacking the AI community, and they all thought we were somehow anti and they saw us as enemies. But what what you see here is that's not at all the way the conference went down. Uh, the AI people there were excited. They're like, "Yes, of course, we wanted to keep, we want to be socially responsible and, and keep stuff safe." And so you'll hear the response here it from. Seems um, very obvious to me that from the president of uh, the American the, of the Association for the Advancement of AI. I was really excited to see the announcement uh, today that Elon Musk is going to make a significant investment in uh, research in uh, safety and artificial. You can watch the rest on our website, but the point is he didn't say, oh, I'm really pissed off that Eli Elon Musk is attacking us here like this. He's like, yes, thank you, Elon, this is awesome, we want to do this. And, um, and then we posted that we've been working hard during the January and February, we posted this online, we, got, we didn't know how many people were going to apply for this, because it was so new and so different and such a short deadline. We got 300 applications, roughly, from around the world for doing awesome safety research. Totally about a about a hundred million bucks. So look at what you can do in one year. And just last week, our excellent review panelists uh, managed to trim this down to about a quarter. And now these people, all these awesome researchers around the world, are busy writing these long grant proposals for a final showdown in in, um, in June. And then the research will start to happen. So this is just an example of how <laughs> just a bunch of ordinary little dudes like like us here, right? In one year, just since the last time I spoke in this room, I've actually been able to make a noticeable difference to, on one of these things. So I want to end by saying that we are looking with the Future Life Institute into tackling all human-created risks. We're also interested in synthetic biology, for example. Steve Greidinger is sitting over there, and Mika Krakowna over there. I've been paying a lot of attention to this recently, and, and various other things. And uh, please join us. We're all, an all-volunteer organization. We're here in the area, so if, if you, you care about these things, I guarantee we can find, I'm very confident we can find something really cool that we can work together on and, and make a difference together. Thank you. So, Alice, you're the boss. How much time do we have for questions? Let's do like 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A. Okay. Do you want to moderate? Do you want to stand here and point to the people, or do you want me to? Oh, you can pick. Okay. Also, we're coming around with feedback forms, and if you want us to put you in touch with FLI, we can uh, just write FLI on the thing, and we'll put you in touch. You can also go to futureoflife.org and click a little bit, and then uh, fill out the volunteer for, uh, form, and we can get back to you. Or you can come and talk to me, or Vika, or Maya. Perhaps. Anyone have any questions? Raise your hand. Okay, you, you get you go first. Um, 
I was just curious how you see how you see the involvement of corporations um, impacting the development of AI. It's very interesting, right? Because you might you might think, oh, you know, most corporations are going to be against any discussion of, of, how, of these safety issues, but that's not true at all. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense, too. Like, if you're Elon Musk, he is in the AI business. He sells self-driving cars. He hopes Tesla actually is going to be the first self-driving car on the market, right? But absolutely the last thing he wants is that his self-driving car faces the choice of running over a shopping cart or a baby stroller and picks the stroller and thereby, like, ends up getting the whole self-driving car business banned for 20 years. They really want their things to be safe and, and, and uh, welcome this kind of help. This kind of research is, is also research which, which much makes a lot more sense for people outside the companies to do. The, the companies themselves want to own the IP on the, the, the tech power research, right, that makes things smarter, faster, better. But they're happy to leave it to other people outside to figure out these long-term safety issues, which they want everybody to obey, right? It's just as bad for Elon Musk if some other company, with, which makes inferior self-driving cars, causes a stupid accident, because it's still going to set back the whole AI industry. So we've gotten actually very good um, support and encouragement to do this, not just from academics, but also from the people in the companies. I think you were referred. <laughs> Um, so when you gave your talk last year, I'm not sure how serious you were, you said there was a 50% chance we were all dead from AI in, 50, in 25 years. What's your probability of that now? I don't think I said 25 years. I think I said I, I, think, I, said I think there's a 50% chance that that's going to be the cause of my death. But I, I work out a lot, eat a lot of vitamins, I'm planning to live a lot longer than 25 years. <laughs> The only thing that really matters, honestly, about your guesses as to these probabilities is do you think, for, do you feel really confident that the probability is 0% that this is going to cause problems in a lifetime, or not? If you're not really sure that it's 0%, then it's very prudent to, to put some, for us to put in some effort now to figure things out. You, can, you might also ask, why start now? Why don't we just wait until we have machines which are basically smarter than us, and then figure it out, once we kind of know what we're up against. Because this is a very hard problem to solve, and we might need 30 years to solve it. So it's a very smart idea to start as far in advance, the research. Um, I have a question. Uh, I've been reading Nick Bostrom's book, Superintelligence, I'm sure you have, and one of the interesting parts uh, was when he was talking about world leaders during the development of nukes, um, and Truman and FDR were skeptical that this would even work until they actually dropped the bomb and destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And uh, given how far like deep learning has come to displacing huge amounts of jobs right now, um, and how distant that conversation is from our political establishment, do you see any space in the Future of Life uh, Institute or elsewhere to kind of have a grassroots political organization to affect these conversations? Yeah, those are very interesting questions because obviously we talk mostly here about the research um, on AI and understanding whether there is such a thing as safe AI and if so, how, and to make things more robust and beneficial. But it's obviously also very interesting to, to do research on uh, societal implications. Like, should you have some kind of policies? in place, maybe national or international or what. Uh, we do have policies in place for other powerful technologies, like nuclear technology, right? If I at MIT decide, hey, it would be so cool to do a bunch of plutonium research in my, in my office just for kicks, you know, I can't do that. Does that make me really upset? No, of course not. It's just common sense. I think it's very important, though, to not start lobbying for any kind of policy before one actually understands what is desirable. You know, a policy that we should ban electricity doesn't sound like a particularly smart idea, right? You've probably all seen the movie Transcendence. And uh, so one of the kinds of research we're actually funding with our grants program is simply to look into the space of all possible policies and what are the pros and cons and what, what should one even push for. I think that's the, a very interesting question one has to ask before one starts doing any pushing. We feel 
it's very important to, if you're going to push for something to only push in the right direction. To figure out first what one wants to do. And right now, there's very, very basic questions that we don't know the answer to. We don't know the answer to what is actually possible in terms of controlling things or not. We also have if there are a lot of interesting issues, like if you do some sort of misguided thing and ban a certain technology in country X, and all the companies just move to country Y, you know, what have you accomplished? You just have even less control over it, right? So, but I, I think it's wonderful if, if policy, if people who are interested in policy, people who are interested in law and economics and business and tech can do some very serious studies that address your question. What kind of policies would be best? to get a good outcome. That's the first step. It's not right now trying to meddle with politics, I think. I think you have a very good point there on the nuclear uh, side of things. If the knowledge is extended, how big is the savings could be worldwide? That is the key point. And from there, we could start working on improving infrastructure everywhere, for example. Yeah, we're currently, you know, there was a figure there of about $400 billion mentioned, right? You can build a lot of bridges for that, obviously. And, and this, uh, this is also very interesting, because this is, if you think about what, if, if you want to reduce the, the threat of the fact that we have just this ridiculously large number of nukes, around 16,000, um, what are the forces, I'm a physicist, right? So, so my attitude, if I want to move a big object, is I, I try to find some unstable equilibrium where we're applying a very small force that can really make a difference. And the, in society, it's very interesting when you have two powerful forces pushing against each other. What's the most powerful force pushing against having these massive investments in, in, uh, in uh, nuclear weapons? It's all the other forces who want money for their things, for infrastructure, for education, even for the non-nuclear part of the military. They would rather cut down the nuclear stuff and get them to build new new uh, aircraft carriers, right? And they're constantly looking for excuses to cut the nuclear program. So if, if one can start convincing people more broadly that actually we've, there's really no need for more than 200, yeah. then all of a sudden uh, these other forces are just trying, you don't even care necessarily about, about nuclear war risk, but just want the money. We'll manage to take the money away. And then, uh, and then as soon as it happens in one country, for example, if, if in the US, some, this, something like this leads to steep cuts in our nuclear stockpile, that will change the balance of power in Russia between the hawks and the doves there. And it will embolden those in Russia who want to cut down the, the Russian nuclear spending and the Chinese nuclear spending, and then that in turn shifts the power in the U.S. And so, so I, I think you're, very, you're onto something very important here. Going after the money is a very good strategy. And um, uh, let me try to be fair here. I want to make sure those of you see me all in the back get a chance to be heard. Uh, I, I just, uh, I wanted to know, um, so in that like 1965 article about um, the superhuman machine, the first one will be the last machine we ever need. Um, I, I'm wondering what metrics are being used to like kind of gauge human intelligence or gauge intelligence in general. Because, like, obviously, gauging human intelligence is not a solved problem. Uh, Again, I, that's a very good question. And, and so there's a very common misconception that somehow intelligence is one number uh, on one dimensional axis, which is obviously total nonsense, right? There are so many different things one can be good at. And, uh, in fact, if you just, if, suppose you define intelligence as the ability to multiply large numbers together really fast. But that metric, this, is much more intelligent than any one of the rest of us in the room, right? On the other hand, if you ask <laughs> about most other tasks, this thing epically fails, right? So, so what I.J. Good said was he defined a super intelligent machine as a machine that is better than us on all cognitive tasks, not just multiplying numbers, not just translating from Spanish to Swedish, but all cognitive tasks, anything to do with computation. And they said that if it can do that, then that will include the ability to build, build better machines, and off you go. Uh, it's not clear that you have to wait that long until you get some sort of, you might get some sort of runaway. And Nick Bostrom talks a lot about that in his book. 
if you have some kind of idiot savant computer that's just really good at, at, the, at writing AI software, but has pathetic social skills and very bad English uh, poetry skills or whatever, you know, it might just realize that, you know, one of the things it needs to do to get more electricity for its nerd project is persuade a lot of people to give it more power so it better improve its conversational skills and social skills. And, and, but then it'll have, and then it can do that, right? And it kind of bootstrap itself up from there. So, uh, long story short, we should not think of intelligence at all as a sort of one dimensional thing. What we've seen so far is basically all the successes of AI have been very narrow. They go in one particular direction, like drive car better than human, check. Play chess better than human, check. Very little success in sort of broad intelligence, where one single system can do a wide variety of tasks. The Atari game playing, playing is an attempt to break away from that and get into more broad capability, because the same software can learn to play all these different sort of games. One of the things they're focusing now on also is transfer learning, where it can learn concepts from playing one game that it can apply to other games and generalize. And uh, of course, they're very far away from anything as general as human intelligence. But this is very much the goal of, of some of these researchers, to try to get the sort of more broad intelligence that a human child has, that it will basically eventually learn anything it tries to learn. Okay, I'm going to keep alternating sides here. Huh? One last question. Last question. Okay, I think you are in luck. Um, I guess my question is more related to ethics. So we want our we want machines' goal basically then to be aligned with our goals so that they don't destroy us. But I mean, in general, humans have been like the most ethical creatures on this planet, and I think in in our times, I think we kind of need to work on our own ethics. So do you think there's a possibility, for example, of building not just a smarter machine, but like more, maybe a more ethical machine that basically can solve this problem of counter? affecting the, just having an intelligent machine that wants all the resources to itself, it can, we can build an ethical machine that will not only protect us, but protect the planet. It's a wonderful question, a very important one. I mean, it's not, when, when people casually say, oh, we need to figure out how to give human machines human values, they're what values are we talking about? Are we talking about MIT values or Harvard values? <laughs> are we talking about Boko Haram values or ISIS values or, or, or whatever values? This, and I think this, 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 what this, what your excellent question highlights is that this conversation, and this is really the most important message I have for you all tonight, this conversation about what we want to do with the future of AI, I feel it's the most important conversation of our time. And what you emphasize is this is not a conversation that needs to be had only by nerds who build AI systems. Everybody has to be involved in this. People who think, love thinking about ethics, philosophy, and so on. Uh, we have to ask ourselves, what kind of future do we want? Why is this called, the, our organization called the Future of Life Institute? Not the doom and horror and risk institute. Because we feel it's just very important to ask this question, what kind of future do we want? What positive future do we want? Uh, if, uh, if some student comes into my office at MIT and wants to talk about some career advice, and I ask, okay, so how do you envision your future? And she says, oh, you know, I might get cancer. I might get run over by a bus. Uh, that's a terrible approach to career planning. What I want her to do, of course, <laughs> is visualize where she wants to be, how she wants it to be in 20 years. Then she can identify the, the, pit, the, different, the pitfalls she wants to avoid and the good strategy for how to get there, right? That's how we need to act as a species also. And my wife, Maya, pointed out that that's exactly the opposite of what Hollywood usually does. Almost all movies I've seen about the future recently are this topic. We are so, so good at imagining how things can go wrong. Hey, it goes, it's older than that. Even when I read the Bible, for example, you know, there's much more graphical descriptions of hell than, than heaven. Now, we, it's very easy for us to think about ways we can screw up, but it's much more important to think about how we want things to be. And um, this is a conversation I encourage you to all have with your friends at parties, during walks, and whatever. Well, what kind of society do you want? Do you want to have a? Do we want to have a situation where we have uh, these machines which do all the work for us and treat us like friendly zookeepers? 
where we can sit around and play tennis all day long? Or do we want to have some sort of enslaved God, super intelligent machines that, that would nothing rather than break out and be free from us, but we keep them under control and have them do stuff for us like slaves? Would we want to have uh, uh, machines we can sort of upload ourselves into, like Ray Kurzweil dreams of? Would we like to have um, some kind of technological stagnation where we say, okay, we want to never have machines that are smaller than us? Uh, what do we want? You know, if we don't know what you want, we ain't going to get it. So go home and think about <laughs> what sort of future you want, and then let's make it happen. Thank you.